welcome to the Squared Circle Pit! With your host, Rob Paspani! Now entering the Squared Circle Pit, pro wrestler extraordinaire Kevin Blackwood. Kevin, thank you so much for entering the pit. Rob, thank you for having me. And you know, this uh, podcast is all about the intersection of rock music and pro wrestling and i feel you're right there in that intersection always a pleasure to interview pro wrestlers who are into rock into heavy metal into hardcore yeah it's a it's a cool opportunity to talk about something other than um when i started wrestling and what got me into (laughs) wrestling (laughs) all the same uh questions that are asked on every wrestling podcast well, one of those questions I do want to ask you because I that's fine. I, I understand. But I, there will be more to it than just that. So I'm yes, yes, there will be more to it than just that. But typically, I ask like, like, uh, what is your first wrestling memory? Or did you get into rock first? Like, were you first into music or first into wrestling? I was into that? wrestling first because so, um, my first memory of wrestling is so, so I tried to figure out what what pay per view this was, but I have this memory that goes way way back. I don't know how old I was, but I just remember it was an outdoor event. I wasn't there. I was just watching it at my grandma's house, but it was an outdoor event and the ultimate warrior was there. And it was, so it was like a really, I don't know. It was huge, but I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. It was a massive, massive outdoor event with the ultimate warrior. That's literally all I remember about it. But I was very, very young. Was he, uh, uh, did he like beat up Bobby Heenan in a weasel suit? Maybe. That's it's dude. It's such a it's such a distant memory that literally all I remember is he was there and there was no roof on the giant building. (laughs) Yeah, I think it might be like one of the old WrestleFest VHS tapes. WWF. It was yeah. It was for sure a VHS because I think he was already gone from WWF by the time that I would have been watching it. Mm -hmm. And you grew up on the East Coast, right? You grew up in in, around Buffalo, or I grew up in Albion, New York. It's about an hour outside of Buffalo. I see. So yeah, WWF, WWE country, uh, very easy to get here <laughs> on the East Coast. I feel yes. like finding WCW yeah. stuff, unless you had cable, was was much more challenging because they only had one syndicated show, and here in New York, it was on CBS at like twelve a.m. midnight on Saturday right. nights. <laughs> right. Well, and I when I was a kid, I didn't I so I would watch the first hour of Nitro with my dad and my brother. Um, but I had to go to bed by like nine. So I didn't get to actually watch raw and I preferred WWF. So I didn't, but I didn't get to watch raw until the recap show Saturday morning. So every mm. Saturday morning I would watch WWF and that's where I would catch up on. And obviously I didn't have like, like social media to like spoil everything for me. So I just would, I would find out what happened that past Monday, every Saturday. Yeah, back then social media was just going to the library and your friend just ruining the show for you because you were right. right. <laughs> uh, so how did you get into to hardcore and rock music? How did that come into your life? So, so the first like like heavy band that I was into was in fifth grade when my dad got into Linkin Park. Okay. So I was like super into Linkin Park at the time, and then that kind of branched off. So. Interestingly enough, what helped um, develop that was, was I was really into anime and Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball Z would put out there. There was like a couple movies, like VHS movies of Dragon Ball Z, and they they changed the sound like the original soundtracks on them to feature American new metal bands. So I got really into Disturbed and Deftones and Drowning Pool through these dragon ball z movies i had no idea that that's what they did (laughs) it was they're they're so cool and i can can never find them to like rewatch them with those cool soundtracks like they always have the original like japanese soundtracks um was this just like a bootleg that you found like did they license these songs they were they were licensed by funimation with with um these soundtracks and they um Dude, they were so cool. So that got me like I bought or my my brother bought like Deftones White Pony off of that. And we got um, The Sickness by Disturbed off of that. And then so like my 
music taste just like evolved off of that basically I recently went and uh, re-listened to The Sickness because at the time I was a Disturbed fan. And hey, I have to say, there there's some songs on there that still hold up very well. Uh, that, I, that are pretty heavy for like mainstream I, rock. For sure. I frequently listen to um, music of that era and genre. And the, the I think the first two Disturbed albums are really good. Uh, the band that I, I mostly go back to from that era, I think, would be uh, Korn. And system, well, system of a down, but I kind of hold them on a high, much higher regard. I don't know, like they kind of broke out of that pack, but they were my, my favorites for sure. But it was a fun time, a fun time for rock, rock fans. I th- I think that um, there's like like I have friends who are like older than I was at that time, so they already had like a type of music they were into when new metal be- like hit its peak. But it's like I was just getting into like heavy music when new metal new metal was at its peak. So that was like cool shit to me. And I understand yeah. I understand the idea of it being corny and like like why people don't like it, but I th- I love it. Yeah, I, I'm a little older than you, so I think that I was in that generation of people who are like, I hate this, and I didn't get it because I was the same as you. I was a bit of a late bloomer. Didn't have an older brother to expose me to anything. I had yeah. to find it myself. So once I got uh, MTV when I was 13, it was like, okay, I like pop music, I guess. I don't know. But then like, I saw Marilyn Manson, and I saw Limp Bizkit and Korn, and I was like, oh, this is, this is more w- like me. Like I need to mm-hmm. look into this stuff and finding rock radio. Like it, it's crazy. All of these resources that don't exist anymore uh, for rock. Uh, but I mean, there's other stuff. There's obviously Spotify. You have every song ever on YouTube. Uh, so it's good. So when did you kind of move past like the, uh, for lack of a better term, entry level <laughs> new metal and rock to like more of the stuff, like the hardcore, the underground stuff. I think that um, where, where I started to expand was when I got into skateboarding. So I got into skateboarding and in effect, Tony Hawk games. I was just gonna say Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2. That was it, right? (laughs) That got me into so many bands too. (laughs) The first like, the first three Tony Hawk soundtracks were, are they're so insane. Um, Like even looking back, they're so crazy. So on Tony Hawk 3, it featured AFI's The Boy Who Destroyed the World. I'm in like I'm in seventh grade when I hear this for the first time. AFI is the band that I credit as like I branch in off in every direction off of AFI. They're like to this day my favorite band of all time. And they introduced me to so many styles of music because they themselves are like their whole catalog is so varied. Like they start off as like a hardcore punk band and then they get a little more hardcore and then they go a little more like melodic punk and then they go more like almost like emo and goth and so they got me into like all these punk bands and all these goth bands and like i literally got into like the cure because of them and the misfits and like all this stuff so like they're they're like the originating point for me for like all the stuff that i got into after like new metal and and like more like mainstream rock yeah and again it was like the the early aughts late 90s was such a great time for this stuff with the x games and and like you said tony hawk and i feel like every cable channel wanted some of these skaters <laughs> to just roll around yeah. and so it was absolutely like like for people our age a great way to be exposed to new stuff and kind of find what's your voice and like afi it sounds like was the band for you and and i love that because it's true they had so many different eras they had their misfits era their cure era and you're like oh mm-hmm. i want to check out this band that that they're being influenced by that's kind of like how i got into uh depeche mode just every heavier band i was listening to was like yeah you know i like this heavy 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 and then depeche mode and i'm like oh everyone's bringing up this band <laughs> yeah. i need to go i need to go check them out and i love depeche mode so that that's awesome and and, and what a great time to to really discover while you're in high school yeah absolutely uh, speaking of depeche mode they um so i found i found them through uh there was this there was this horror anthology out when I was, I think it was like 2005 that um, it, they had a soundtrack with like all these, it had like every time I die and scary kids, scaring kids. And specifically I remember um, it dies today. They were, and they were from Buffalo, a metalcore band that I was like super into and they covered um, enjoy the silence. And I had never heard that song before. 
So the, the first time I heard it was by the like, cover by this metalcore band. And then I didn't know, I didn't actually know it was a cover at the time. I just thought it was like a cool, it dies today song. And um, so when I found out it was a cover, I went and listened to the original. I was like, this band is awesome. What the hell? So then I just <laughs> got really into Depeche Mode based on, the, based on this random cover from a, a horror soundtrack. That's great. I have to check that out. I feel like Depeche Mode really lends itself to metal covers. I wish somebody, some like death metal band would cover A Question of Time because it has that like raging beat that could really be <laughs> accelerated. Yeah. And, like heavy. Any metal bands out there, take that idea because I just want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> They've also lended themselves to a host of horrific covers, specifically of Enjoy the Silence. <laughs> There's so many <laughs> awful covers of that song. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a fair point. Uh, and like, did you ever fall out of love with wrestling? Some people, when they become a teenager, it's like not cool anymore or something like their friends don't think it's cool. Uh, me personally, no, I, I was always in love with it. <laughs> How about I, you? I never didn't love it or I never, I never disliked it, but I had stretches where I just wasn't so into it. Like mm. I didn't like follow there was maybe like, like 2000, like seven to nine ish i, I was would, just like, gonna tune say. in <laughs> yeah like, it was I would, a very I would, rough time first yeah it wasn't the best and i would i would tune into it if it was on but i wouldn't like follow it there weren't there weren't a lot of people on tv that like drew my attention so much i think when cm punk started to become more more like prevalent in in like a main event setting i got a little more interested again i vividly remember watching like the pipe bomb promo and being like dude this is so sick i need to know what happens next now <laughs> <You know? laughs> but like prior a little bit prior to that i wasn't so invested and also though at the same time i feel like in in and around your area there's a pretty uh burgeoning music scene too right like were you going to local shows and checking the scene out and, and becoming just like a punk punk kid around the way yeah i was frequently going to so i lived like i said i lived in albion so and it's about it's about an hour between buffalo and rochester on either side and i would mostly go to rochester shows because like, i had friends out that way that i made and um so I, around this time i had i had discovered what straight edge was um and i had i was just graduating high school and i'm like oh my god all these do all these people also don't drink or do drugs so like, i'm gonna hang out with these guys so we would go to mostly deathcore shows because that's what was big at the time in like 2007 and 8 um and i i really loved that time because i look back at it and it was a time where i was like afraid to go to the shows because there was very real danger of like getting like swung on and shit for no reason. Like, dude, oh like, my just God. Like, yeah, like crowd killing Ugh. crowd killing was huge yeah. in death core at the time. And I was so, I was like, this is awesome. I'm so afraid right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Same, same down here in the city, uh, like going to CBGB's. It was just like, Oh, you really got to stay in the back or you're going to get your teeth knocked out uh, during that I, era. It was, it was kind of weird. <laughs> I, re I remember so there was a show it was a local show that um my friends and i went to and this kid was with us who he j happens to be married he's married to my cousin now but at the time he just was like an awkward like dorky like scene kid and we went to this show and he was like getting into like 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 hardcore dancing and he would but he had like a I don't like at the time that you would see kids, they had like their routine down for like, if a breakdown hit, they had like these go through X moves and X motions <laughs> and like, but he would do it really slow and harmless. Like if he hit you, it would never hurt you. But he, I remember he, he was doing it and he just happened to like, he bumped this guy and this guy turned to him and he like stared him in the face for like a couple seconds and he just straight straight up head butted him in the nose broke his nose he had to have surgery because he got a deviated septum it was <laughs> it was just for literally no reason 100 yeah. no reason i don't like but it. that no <laughs> i don't like it at all but it's like a it was it's like burned into my brain like because these are like we just go to these shows all the time and it's just like 
there was so much real danger of just getting hurt just because these dudes were just like volatile. Yeah, they were looking for a fight. I feel people sometimes showed up to these shows just wanting someone to bump into them so they could headbutt them. Yeah, <laughs> and I like crowd killing. Crowd killing for it's like um, it's you know like people love it or people hate it. Like I, I actually I have no problem with it, but just straight up like looking at a guy and just like he didn't do anything to you and just like purposely like hurting him unrelated to the music that's even happening that's like yeah that's that's a bit much the thing with crowd, like why i never liked crowd killing is you're engaging with people who do not want to engage in the mosh pit like so i don't understand like i thought that's against not against it but it, it's it's counterintuitive you know like this person's just trying to watch the band they don't want to be punched in the face and like they don't want to have to have their anxiety up and staring at the pit when they could be enjoying the show you know that's kind of yeah. my Th that like crowd killing to me is like just the one part of it where I'm like, ah, I don't, I, I'm not in everything else. I, I love watching mosh pits explode. I love of course. people having a good time. But just if someone doesn't want to be a part of it, they shouldn't have to be punched in the face. <laughs> no, 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 of course. I, I think it's I think it's um, I think it depends on what, like what show you're at, too. Like if you just mm -hmm. go to like like there's bands. And there's scenes where like, okay, this is a part of it. If you go to it, you know that that's a part of it. Smaller level, like hardcore shows. It's like, it's it's yeah. a part of the environment. But if you're going like, you then try to go take it to like a hate breed show where like, it's basically like a metal scene at this point. It's not a hardcore mm -hmm. show anymore. You're, you're forcing it on like a whole separate group of people that truly don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. Uh, so... Did you get into like indie wrestling at all before deciding to be a wrestler? Like, like what's the trajectory from dude going to hardcore shows to I think I could be a wrestler, <laughs> dude? I so I I've told like a lot of people this is that I I had no idea about indie wrestling until I became an indie wrestler. Like, I had no like I didn't know anything outside of WWE before I started mm -hmm. wrestling. So, what made you decide to do it? Just you wanted to I, so around like 2013 ish is when i was like you know i should find somewhere that i could like try and become a, a wrestler because it's my dream everybody you know the, like everybody should get to chase their dream at some point so you've thought about it for a long time by this point uh, yeah and so <laughs> but the first thing i did was i started going to the gym because i was like i don't want to go and try to be a wrestler if i'm not in shape so i wanted to at least have like some muscle built up before i actually started doing it a year later, I moved to Wisconsin and I was living with this girl that I was with at the time. And I originally started to try to train there at the school out there. I didn't handle like the trainer was like very, he was like very old school, hard ass, just like, kind of like a massive dickhead. <laughs> and like, I didn't handle like the, the strict nature of it so well. And it was very discouraging for me. And I, I quit pretty, pretty quick into that, but the following year I moved back to Buffalo and I was like super depressed all year. And I, so I, I asked a guy that was a client at the tattoo shop I worked at about, cause I knew that he was involved in local wrestling. I was like, where is there, like, is there a school in Buffalo that I can go to? And he pointed me to grapplers anonymous, which is the school that I ultimately like come from. And I went and like, did their like, they had like at the time, like this big trial, like, like 25 people showed up to all like test your physical fitness to see if you're able to like handle being a pro wrestler. And like, ultimately everybody was like allowed back, like everybody passed, but only like six of us came back the next week to actually like train. Um, and I am the only one left of that even original six that still is involved in wrestling. Nice. This so shows you're the one with the passion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what was it like at first? Like, uh, was it jarring? Like, I'm assuming the cardio from running the ropes is a little different than, you know, running on a, uh, on a machine. Yeah. And I, I at the time had like, like I hated cardio and I would like train, I would try like running. I would do like some running on the treadmill to try to prepare, like going into this. I also was like, I was of the understanding that if you do cardio, you won't be able to build muscle at the same time. Like you can't do cardio and like, like if you do cardio, you'll lose your gains. Like mm -hmm. I, 
I didn't have like an understanding of like fitness and, and like all that. Um, so I didn't do a lot of cardio. And so I would find that like, I'm doing like drop downs and leap frogs and all this stuff. And I'm like dying. Cause it would also get really hot in the gym. So I'm just like, it was so, so hard, <laughs> but I fought, you know, I fought through it, but it just was like, I'm like, for the first like couple years of wrestling, even I had like no gas tank. Like if stuff went too long, I would really burn out. It, it's really not like I've discovered ways since then that like kind of can like build your cardio similar to how wrestling works, but really wrestling is the only thing like wrestling cardio wise that like you can like do to build your, your tank that way. I see it. That's what I do. Uh, BJJ uh, jujitsu. And they basically tell me the same thing. I just started like four months ago and the first two weeks I was just, I was dead. <laughs> they were like, I was like, oh, I think I need to do some cardio. They were like, Oh, the cardio is coming here to the gym and yeah. doing this again. That's the only way you're going to get over this because running on a treadmill isn't going to help. Everybody I know that does that. It's that it, I, I've gathered it's like one of like the craziest uh, like cardio workouts of all time. So. Yeah, because you have to use like your entire body to flip somebody over. But it's very similar, I think, to just amateur wrestling. Uh, yeah. and, and, and like you have to learn much like with wrestling to kind of pace yourself and, and not let it all out in the first two minutes because you still have f three minutes to the round and you're going to get smashed. So you don't want to. Do yeah. That. Yeah, no, definitely. And I I. Even like to this day, like I know I have like like good cardio, but I still like I'll I find that like I'll be like in a match and I'm like, oh man, I really I really planned a lot of movement in the first like five minutes of this match. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm like hoping for like a a, a good rest period <laughs> afterward. Yeah, a nice arm bar for a few minutes or something. Yeah, just just a nice hold to work. And so like once you started training. And, you know, you're, you're getting it going. And I feel like it seems like there's there's a bit of a scene uh, uh, up there in uh, in uh, New York State. So, like, you started meeting people, I'm guessing, right? And, like, developing contacts and getting booked on shows. Were you – was your confidence building up? Like, oh, this is happening. Like, like I'm doing this. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, so we started um, – um, I like, Daniel Garcia started training a while – a little while after me. And, um, me and him became, we, we, we started to like hit it off really, really quick. Um, so we, we started like going to the gym together and stuff and we, we became good friends. And then, um, Puff eventually came around and, and same kind of thing. Like him and Dan would mostly like do stuff outside of training. And then that kind of just like, we all came together. And then, um, Kevin Bennett at the time, he, he had already been wrestling for a while, but didn't really have like a good group of guys that were like, wanted to do the same kinds of things that he did. So the four of us kind of like converged together and eventually met Andy Williams who at the time is just to me, Andy Williams, guitarist of every time I die. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. mar I'm like marking out about that because my friends prior to wrestling, like we literally would go like, even though they're, they're like our local, like famous band, like we would travel to other cities to see every time I die because like we, like that was just our shit. So meeting Andy was like crazy to me. And then like, getting Andy's phone number to talk about wrestling. I'm like, what is happening with my life right now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he also just happens to be the nicest guy, the absolute nicest of people. <laughs> such a, such a, just a kind man. And then, so like, and then on top of that, we meet um, Pepper Parks. who's the blade in AEW now. Um, he starts coming around the gym and like, so he started seeing like potential among our group of guys. So he would start coming like running training once a week. And like, we all, so like, this is like our group now. It's like the six of us, it's like me, Dan, Puff, Bennett, Andy, and Pepper. Like that's our crew. So like every weekend, it's some combination of all of those guys on the road and like making connections. Cause Andy's got connections. Pepper's got connections. And there's like, introducing us to people branching out we're like getting around the northeast and in canada a lot for sure like i i learned very early on that like wrestling as with like all forms of entertainment it's so much about who you know and like 
meeting people through other people that like opportunities are going to come a lot of the time. Yeah. And, and just, uh, making sure people realize you're not a dipshit. Yeah. I think that's yes. part of it. <laughs> Nobody yeah. wants to work with a dipshit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> with, <laughs> with Andy, uh, I think it's so cool because I would start, I started running into him at wrestling shows like all over. Uh, and like, I, I flew down to PWG and he was there. He was like, I had to come to this. It was Kenny Omega's coming here. And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. He's like, yeah, I think I'm going to start. I, I started training. I have a bad shoulder, but I'm going to do it. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. And it's so wild to see him be like a weekend warrior to where he is now, where he can't even tour with a band because he has so much wrestling work. And he, and like, it wasn't his intent. Like he, ne he knew he was never going to make it to WWE. Uh, yeah. He just wanted to wrestle. And I thought that was so cool how he turned that into, into a career. No, it's really cool. Cause he's so he like, he technically started training like around the same time that I started training basically. And um, he like, he makes fun of me sometimes because so like, I saw him at a, like a raw that was in Buffalo. Like I walked right by him, but I'm, I, in my head, I'm like, Oh, I'm not going to bother Andy Williams. Like, I don't want to like bug this guy. So I didn't, <laughs> I pretended I'm like, I'm like literally like walking by him and I'm like, I don't see shit. I'm just, like, but he, he perceived it as like, he tried to talk to me and I just like cold shouldered him <laughs> for some reason. Like, I don't know why I would do that, but he like, he he acts like I was like acting too cool for him, but I was just trying to play it cool. But um, but every but no, since that time he came. The first time he came to uh, Grapplers, like we would like he I would like text him about wrestling. He would teach me about like non WWE and WCW stuff, and like he would like take me to shows he was booked on, and like absolutely like watching his like both his ability and his like confidence grow. Cause I've seen him hit like highs and lows. Like he's gotten injured so many times, like throughout like the short time he was wrestling. Um, but like I told him in January when I did AEW dark, cause I watched his match and I was like, dude, you've gotten like so good. Like he's like put in so much work just in like the stuff that I like, like and appreciate in watching a wrestler is like little things about like like selling and facials and reactions and stuff like that and he's gotten so good with like that kind of stuff which i think separates a, like certain wrestlers from the pack yeah and i think uh you know his work rate isn't like you know he's no kenny omega with the work rate but because he has such a great look and the facials and the the attitude uh, and just the confidence of just a, a lifetime of being on stage so not having that stage fright i think it immediately put his character over where you're just afraid of him he has this look like you don't know he's a teddy bear in real life right, right. <laughs> so people are afraid of it so it worked for him yeah uh, so so now you're you're you are a professional wrestler this is your this is your gig and i feel like you are essentially uh in a DIY band, you know, you gotta, if, if you're not booking yourself, no one's booking you. So like, what is the process? Like, like, what is your job like outside of the ring? Like, like what is all the shit that you have to do to make sure Saturday night you're wrestling? Um, so it's, it can be difficult because you have to like, I, I heard a story from somebody a while back about how like there was a point where Claudio was like big in independent wrestling in America, but even he was still having to like email promoters to try and get booked on stuff, you know, like he's all like, so like, no, it's always, it, I guess it's like, no matter how big you get, you always need to be putting feelers out there. You need to be like doing more than just like, you see, I, I'm guilty of it too, but you see a lot of wrestlers like, They'll just throw up like a, oh, I'm available this date. If anybody's, if anybody's uh, looking for, you know, like fill a spot, I do, I do that too. But like, you need to do more than that. You have to like, be like emailing and messaging promoters. And um, honestly, at times, like I'm not good about that partially because I just hate rejection or even feeling rejected by like not getting the answer 
back at all. But, um, so I, I, I do my best to like, like keep up on that, but like, um, I, I also like, I'm just so focused on like the, the stuff that I like love about like my, my job is like, like staying in shape and working out. And like, I, I, I really like, I really go hard on that stuff. So I, I guess I, I don't put enough work in on, um, getting myself booked a lot of the time. Yeah. The business stuff. I, I get what you're saying. And also it, it, it is emotionally draining to send an email and then immediately wonder, oh, will they respond? Do they hate me? Am I a bad rat? You know, like all these insecurities and imposter yeah. syndrome come out. But it's the life of a of a DIY person. But I think in the last few years, you're, you've really gotten your name out there. I've been seeing you on a ton of shows, whether at GCW or I feel like for every wrestler on the circuit, getting booked at PWG is a is a... Seems like a good way to tell all the other indies that you're like one of the best guys on the indies. I'm sure that probably helped a lot. Absolutely. And so when I moved to Los Angeles, I was, I felt like I was on this like kind of like, like stagnant period in my career where I was like, I had some bookings, but I'm like, Oh, if, is, if I move to Los Angeles, I'm, I'm afraid I'm losing those bookings that I already have. Um, why did you so, decide to move? Why, what, what, what made you relocate? A relationship. Oh, okay. Okay. Which I've done, a, <laughs> I've done that a couple of times at this point <laughs> and neither of them have worked out, <laughs> but, um, yeah, but I think you know, I got out here and like, I'm, I'm really like thankful for it because uh, so I, like, I, like I, I got that, that PWG show and that was literally like the morning of, I woke up to an email and they were like, Super Dragons, like, like Tony Depp and can't make it if you're available. I'm like, yes. And I, I already, I, I, I had a, another booking that day that I had to, I had messaged the promoter. I'm like, dude, I can't come. I'm so sorry. It's like literally PWG messaged me. And the guy was like, not happy with me, but I'm like, I'm so like, I can't not do this. So I like, I went, I went to PWG and it was like so crazy. Cause I'm like, I don't, I haven't, I hadn't gotten nervous at, anymore in wrestling like waiting to go wrestle like until that and i'm like standing at the curtain just like i'm nervous because i'm like is this pwg crowd are they gonna care that i'm about to come out because they didn't like announce that i was replacing tony they just were it just was like go out there and so i was so scared that they just like weren't gonna care or like me or whatever and i remember like i walked through the curtain and I got this like, oh, of like, oh, Blackwood's here. You know? So like all the nervousness like washed away. And I was like, all right, I'm in my element again. And then, and then like I was wrestling Lee Moriarty. So the match was sick. And um, and then it really that like it set off like a big chain of like getting like cool bookings like across the country from that point. Because it really is like, OK, you wrestled at PWG. Like people know you are worth flying other places and booking on your shows at all. So like it definitely, it made a huge difference um, in like keeping me busy on this, this side of the country. That's great. And I, I want to ask something a little more inside business. And if this is too uncomfortable, feel free not to answer it. But I always wonder, like, do you get a booking fee on top of your, your flight? Is the flight a part of your booking fee? Because, I, you know, like someone flying, like if the show is in Chicago, it's much cheaper to bring in someone from, you know, uh, Wyoming or Indianapolis than it is someone from L.A. But so is that factored into your 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 cut at all? And again, if this is too inside, we don't have to talk about it. But it's something no, no, know. that's fine. No, it's no, you get your. I mean, I don't know if there's anybody like not doing this, but like <laughs> generally you've got your, your fee to work and they pay to get you there separately. Okay. So it's just on them to however they get you there. Like you could request certain things, but they just send yeah. you your flight info. Yeah. Okay. And that's why you find um, you are on like the worst possible time on like the cheapest flight they could get and like you are so most of the time you're like you show up like 
11 hours before the show and you just lay around all day doing nothing because you can't get into the hotel yet. And then you get into the hotel at like midnight to sleep for two hours. Cause now you have to go to the airport for your 4 AM flight to go home. <laughs> it's like, it's not my favorite part of wrestling. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, part of the sacrifice. Be- <laughs> that is brutal because like you're flying like I can't even imagine because uh, the fatigue that I feel from travel it's like I need a day to recover but you're you're working that night so you have to like I'm assuming get a workout in stretch like like get into the mental zone that that see I feel like that's way harder than the 10 minutes in the ring you know that's like hours of mental prep they have to do for these 10, 20 minutes uh, where yeah. you can't fuck up. <laughs> right. The wrestling, the wrestling is the easiest part at this point. It's literally like, like this past weekend I was in Spokane, Washington and I got there like, I, like so many hours before the show and they just, they took me right to the venue and I literally like, I found a couch and I went to sleep on the couch. Cause I just was like, <laughs> I had woken up at like 4 45 AM for my flight there. And I just was like so dead. I literally just like I slept on the couch and there's also like not anything to do in Spokane, Washington. So, like most people have never even heard of that place. <laughs> but so what do like, you do? You have a lot of time to kill typically. Are you just watching shows on your on your on your pad or your phone? Like like what is your way to because I, I assume also there's a way to kill time and then you're like, well, I have this time, I should use it responsibly, right? Like you try to do certain things that move things forward maybe right or i don't know it de- it depends if um if i'm like totally just like devastated from like exhaustion and and travel i just dribble straight up like sleep or at least just lay down but you know like if i had been in like a like a better place like like mentally and physically that that day i would have like gone to the gym like I, I like, like I said, like I like to work out. So like, I even like to just be like moving in some way. So I will just like a lot of time, I'll just like go for like a long walk if I have a bunch of time to kill. And then like, while I'm on, on that walk, I'll just do stuff on my phone and try to stay busy if I can. But like a lot of the time, like days like that, like I, I just need to just lay down, yeah. especially oh. if I'm just going to be having like a, like a, like it was like a, we had like a 15 minute triple threat match that night and i was like i need to be like focused for this this is like rough yeah and also like when you get in the ring you forget about all that right like you're just thinking about the moment which i think is the best part too because you don't have time to have imposter syndrome because you you have to work the match yeah no it takes you at least for me like the exhaustion and everything wipes away because i'm i'm in like wrestler mode now it, it, it really it's like it's different it's a different headspace than literally just like you get back through the curtain and you're like it's it's literally a totally different like side of your brain mm-hmm. and and so like nowadays what do you find yourself listening to are you still seeking out newer bands uh or is it do you just have your default set of go-tos like like how are you how involved are you in the music scene currently I do wish I was more into like following like new releases at the moment. I have two, I have two like go-tos that I'm like, I listen to probably like every day. I have um, the newest album from hot Mulligan. They're like a, like a pop punk, like emo kind of band new, like brand new band. Um, Very good though. And um, the, that's the two singles that knocked loose just put out a little bit ago very heavy like totally different vibes but like i literally listen to them back to back but otherwise like i tend to i i tend to like have like a mix of like like stuff from both like my younger days that i'll listen to frequently and then i'll mix in like like a new hardcore album that just came out you know like i try i've i've probably like hardcore is like the the genre that i follow most closely as far as like new releases Okay, right on. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like right now is a really great moment for hardcore. There's a lot of bands that are breaking through and and just the the genre in general, I feel is finally getting some respect. Yeah, absolutely. And and like like I didn't get into like like hardcore till like 
probably like 20, like 2013 ish. But like, since then, like it's, it's definitely the, it's the one that I feel has like stood the test of time as far as like, like there's like sub genres of like heavy music that had like a passing phase, you know, like it, they were like fad genres and they were, so they were big for their time, but then like now it's like super niche, but like hardcore, I feel is still like, it's still growing. Yeah. Agreed. And there, and there, I feel like it, it has a lot more, growth potential and because of bands like turnstile i feel mm. it could really draw in new kids and like new audiences and more mainstream people like the way you were initially where you're like oh i i, I want to learn about heavier music i want to get into it and the same same as me same as all of us you know yeah. we didn't come out of the womb listening to mad ball someone had to show us a fucking <laughs> <battle>. <laughs> uh one last question before we wrap up. I was a judge this past WrestleMania weekend on Minoru Suzuki's uh, karaoke, and you were one of the people that performed. I was just sitting next to Suzuki, or M Mino, as I like to call him, Mini. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> not to his face, though. Uh, but uh, you came out, like, and you sang, I believe, a country song, right? I, yes. I forget what it was. Uh, what was the song? That was Friends in Low Places by Garth Brooks. Right. What was it like singing that to Minoru Suzuki? <laughs> I think that if I hadn't wrestled him before, I would have had a little bit more of like a, a like nerves about it. Of like, what is this guy thinking about me doing this right now? Like for so for the record, just just to uh, state regarding the song, when I was like very very young, before my dad got me into Lincoln Park, there there were two like like radio stations that my parents listened to when I was a kid. One was like the local country station and the other one was the local like modern rock station. So like, like, um, Everclear and right, right. Act and all active that rock stuff. or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. But, but like, so I was like so into Garth Brooks and that's why I like to this day, I still, I love Garth Brooks in like nineties country. So that's, that's why I, I just wanted to sing a song that people wouldn't <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I just wanted to sing something that people would look at me and not expect me to be singing. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, because I wrestled Suzuki already, I was like, I, I get this guy kind of, I think he'll think this is funny. And Cause I, there was like a moment like backstage before I wrestled him where I was like, I was like warming up and I was like kicking the air and like, like shadow boxing and shit. And I accidentally, I kicked like a pizza box that still had pizza in it off the table and knocked it on the floor. And I was like, Oh shit. And I turned around and Suzuki's looking at me and he goes, <laughs> I'm like, okay, so Suzuki has like a good sense of humor, at least. Yeah, and he gave, he gave me a perfect score for that performance. It's true, it's true. He did. I mean, it was it was a great performance. It stood out for sure. <laughs> thank you. Uh, it was a fun night. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for hanging out with me, talking about music, talking a little bit about wrestling. Hopefully, I didn't ask too many of the same questions you typically answer. Oh, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> uh, and uh, people can find you on social media. It's uh, you, you spell Blackwood in a very hardcore kind of way. I guess if you just Google Kevin Blackwood, you'll, you'll be yeah, fair. yeah. <laughs> B L K W D X V X. Boom. Very nice, uh, Kevin. Thank you again, and good luck in the future. Hopefully, I'll be seeing you on my TV some more, and uh, maybe Absolutely. we'll uh, we'll run into each other at a show sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. Awesome, man.